Hello everybody. I have typeset my notes, my lecture notes for formal methods and discrete structures, which I will present now in the series of presentations called lecture recaps, which are basically recaps of the same material that's in the lecture but with maybe some easier to read uh, material. In some cases I think the presentation will be improved uh, as well. Okay, so let's begin with lecture one, recap. The definition of an expression has four parts. First, a constant or a variable is an expression. So a constant is a number like 231. A variable is represented by a lowercase letter, for example, the lowercase letter x. So in algebra you might have 231 times x, and 231 would be a constant and x would be the variable. The second part of the definition of an expression is if E is an expression, then open paren E close paren is an expression. And notice that E is uppercase as opposed to the variable in the first part of the definition, which is a lowercase x. So our convention in this course and throughout uh, formal methods and discrete structures, we will use the convention that uppercase letters are expressions and lowercase letters are variables. Now the third part of the definition of an expression is if circle is a unary prefix operator and capital E is an expression, then circle E is an expression with operand E. So this circle represents can represent any unary prefix operator. The example given here is the hyphen, which is, which if it is in front of the 5, because 5 is an expression, because it is a constant, and hyphen is the, is the negative sign, so that comes before the 5, so hyphen 5 is an expression. And the fourth part of the definition of an expression is, if star is a binary infix operator and capital D and capital E are expressions, then D star E is an expression with operands D and E. So notice that in this case, the binary infix operator is in between the two operands, D and E, whereas with the unary prefix operator, the prefix operator is in front of the operand. And I will leave it to the main lectures for the examples of expressions. And here again, uh, this is the table of precedences, which is described in the main lecture. Starting with textual substitution, which has the highest precedence on row A, and this equivalence uh, sign in row M at the bottom, which has the lowest precedence. And here again, I will leave it to the main lecture for examples of how, precedence, how the precedences work. Now, there's two more concepts for, th for this lecture. The first concept is the, con the next concept is the concept of state. So what is state? A state is a list of variables and their values. For example, suppose you have a computation where there are two variables, x and y. In this example, open paren x comma 5 close paren represents the fact that variable x has the value 5 and open paren y comma 6 close paren represents the fact that variable y has the value 6 and then this is a list of the this is the list of the variables and their values so that is an example of state so remember a state is a list of variables and their values Now, an interesting fact about state is that an expression may be true in some states but not in other states. So let's do an example of this fact. The expression 2 times x plus 3 times y equals 7 is true in some states but not in others. Now, why is 2 times x plus 3 times y equals 7 an expression? Well, first of all, 2 is an expression because it is a constant x is an expression because it is a variable 
and the multiply sign, which is omit, omitted by convention in algebra, but it's still there, is in between the 2 and the x. So that multiply sign is a binary infix operator, so therefore 2 times x is an expression. Similarly, 3 times y is an expression because 3 is a, an expression because it is a constant, and y is an, ex is an expression because it is a variable. And then the plus operator that's in between the 2 times x and the 3 times y makes the 2 times x plus 3 times y also an expression. And furthermore, after that, 7 is an expression because it is a constant. And then the equal sign is <coughs> a binary infix operator. So this whole thing is an expression. <coughs> now you can see from algebra, your knowledge of algebra, that if x has the value of 5 and y has the value negative 1, that this expression is true. Now why is that? that? That's because if x has the value of 5, 2 times 5 is 10. y has the value of negative 1, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. And sure enough, 10 minus 3 does equal 7. So that's true in that state. But if you plug in the value of 1 for x and the value of 2 for y, then 2 times x plus 3 times y does not equal 7. So this expression is true in some states, but not in other states. Okay, now the last concept is the concept of textual substitution, which is an operation that we will use throughout this course and the next. It's really the basic. It's really very, very basic. And you have done textual substitution before in your algebra classes, but I'm sure that it was not ever presented in the way that we will present it and use it in this course. So what is textual substitution? Well, textual substitution has three parts. It has a big E and a little x and a big R. So what, and, and this square bracket, open square bracket between the E and the x, that's part of the textual substitution. And then the, the closed square bracket at the, on the, on the right-hand side of the R is, is the other part of the textual substitution uh, notation. And in between the x and the R is what is sometimes called the walrus operator. It's a colon followed by an equal sign. And you can, you can tell it looks kind of like a walrus with his tusks hanging out of his mouth with his head turned sideways. That's why it's called the walrus operator. You might be able to visualize it there, kind of like a little emoji. And so what does this textual substitution mean? Well, let's look at the three parts individually, first starting with the E. Okay, E, capital E, is an expression. We know that because we, we, it's, it is written as an uppercase letter. And remember, by convention, all uppercase letters represent expressions. So what is an expression? Well, it, you imagine th that this E has constants in it, and it has some, might have some variables, and it could have some unary prefix operators, and it could have some binary infix operators, and it could have some open parens and some closed parens all over the place. So think of that E as a big expression with all those parts to it. So that E is that expression. Now what about the X? The X is a variable represented by a lowercase letter. Now actually, um, in general, it's possible to have, instead of just having one variable, that's, you, it's possible to have more than one variable. Like if, if you, you, you could have like an X comma Y, in which case there would be two variables. Instead of just one, you could have three or four, or however many you need for the particular application. And then what about this R? This R is an expression, which is the text to be substituted for the variable. And here again, if there is more than one variable on the left of the walrus operator, there has to be more than one, there has to be the same number of expressions to the right, all separated by commas. We will see examples of, of this uh, in a minute. Now, what does this mean? What does this textual substitution mean? What is, it, what is the operation itself? itself? Here, here it is. E with X, oh, by the way, the way we pronounce this is e, e with X replaced by R. So the way you say that walrus operator is replaced by, that's the phrase that we, that we will use. So this is E with X replaced by R. What it means is, or what it is, the operation is, the expression E with all occurrences of variable X replaced by expression R. Okay, so again, it's the expression E with all occurrences of variable X replaced by expression R. 
And here again, I will leave it to the main lecture for the examples. Table 1.1 from our textbook has uh, s several examples of textual substitution, and I'll let you work through those yourself. I will assume I'm going to go through these recaps pretty, uh, pretty quickly, assuming that you can pause and repeat if necessary on your own time. So these will be pretty short. And this will conclude the recap for Lecture 1 for Formal Methods. Okay, great. See you for Lecture 2.